Gentlemen's welcome to the wise old school of how to win forged in fire. Our class today will consist, I hope, of some, some basic things. A lot of this you're going to know, but I, I think it's good to go to go over some of the things um, and kind of put them in order, put them in perspective, and uh, kind of fresh them up in your mind, if you will. So I've broken it down. I hope you can read this. Um, if not, I, I apologize. Um, obviously, I, I don't... Uh, have cast or crew here so we'll just use what we got uh, we will dive right in because this is going to be long so um number one mindset two things attitude and what i call compartments um attitude uh, are you having a bad day um, somebody cut you off in traffic, you didn't get a good night's sleep, uh, you've got to adjust that before you walk in that, that foraging area. Uh, I may or may not have told you this, I think I've told Tim, I don't know if I ever told you Jesse. One of the things one of my bosses told me <clears throat> was when he walked into work, he imagined at the front door a waterfall. And when he walked through that waterfall, it washed everything off from the outside. He forgot about home, the car that didn't work, the water pump he's got to put in his Cadillac. Uh, all that kind of stuff was out of his mind. And he thought about forging and making knives. And that's it. When you walk back out, then you leave all that stuff at work. And then you address the outside stuff. So you, you have to get that attitude right in your mind. And I, I've told people to do this. Few do it, but the ones that do uh, say it really works quite well after a while. It doesn't work immediately. It, it, like anything, you have to practice this. But you guys have got time, both of you. Uh, you know, even a week or two after that, they tell me it works good. And that's about the amount of time it took me. Just when you walk into your shop, when you go through that door, imagine yourself washing everything away and you're focusing only on the shop only on the forge and only on the knives and do it consistently and when you go up there you're going to do it automatically number two or b i should say compartments uh, by compartments I, I want you to learn to think of you know, don't walk in there and, you know, obviously they're going to tell you how to do your knife, uh, the, the initial one for the, the competition. I don't want you to think, well, let's see, you know, i gotta, I got to do the handles, i got to do blade, and I think I'll do a hidden tang, or I'll do a stick tang, I'll do this. I want you to think in compartments. Your first compartment, what steel are they giving me to work with? How do I physically have to put this steel together? Is it laminate? Is it Damascus? Is it, God forbid, canister steel? I don't see why they even have people do that. Um, is it a lawnmower? But whatever. And then look back and remember everything that you know about that steel. Now we're going to touch on that again uh, in a little bit, so I won't belabor that point too much. That's, that's a box. That's a container. That's where your head is. You're not thinking of anything else. Once that's done, then you're going to think of the forge. How hot is it? How does it work? How many burners should I use? And we're going to go into that in more depth here soon too. So the next step is the only thing in your box at that time. And only when you complete that step, you close that box and move on to the next one. That 10 minute window at the beginning is where you develop your overall plan. I'm going to make this knife. This is how I'm going to do it. And then you step into your boxes and go from box to box. The next heading we have here is tools. Now, I know that I see people walking in with their hammers and, uh, you know, various tools or tongs. Uh, maybe they told you, Tim. Uh, what you're allowed to take, maybe not. I would ask this question. Can you have one of these? A thermometer? Um, I don't know, so I would ask that question.
Can you have a set of these calipers? You need these things if they'll let you use them. Uh, that will save you so much grief. Um, and just think of doing a, an entire knife. Think of the tools you use in your shop that you could put in that bag that would really help you and are they allowed to be used. Um, so that's, I have an A and B, that's forging and measuring. Two most important tools, familiar hammers, um, you know, or, or, or whatever they'll allow you to take and measuring devices that you're used to using. I'm sure they'll have some there and if that's what you have to use, fine. If not, then, then take your own. I would ask that question. Okay, three. And we'll circle it so I don't forget where I've been. Uh, forging. And I've got just two very broad headings. Do and don't. Okay, under the do, I want you now to use the time between now and when you actually fly up there for the competition. I want you to, and this is one of your homework assignments, and there will be a quiz, I will check. I want you to take a, a, a spiral notebook, three ring binder or something, and I want you to list out every common steel you can think of. And then I want you to look that steel up. I want you to find out the composition, even if you think you know it, look it up anyway. Find the composition and look at the heat tree. Try to memorize the annealing temperatures. Try to memorize the, um, the uh, tempering temperatures. If you can, group them. You know, and I don't know this, so I'm just going to pick two at, at random. We'll say that L6 and O1 have the same tempering and annealing temperatures. And try and put them in a box. Remember our boxes. And remember that if I have either one of these, 1,500 and 800, I'm making up numbers obviously, but you, you get the point. And I want you to review all those steels, even the ones you think you know well. And that should help you a lot to not overheat or, or underheat. Um, you know, you know, both of you know forging, you know, far better than I do. I've, I've done just a little tiny bit of it. You guys have both made a lot of knives, Jesse, especially you. Um, look at their forges. They're not your forge. You have no idea how hot they get. Um, one of the, the tips, and we'll go into this when I get, there's a heading over here for judges. We'll go into that. Uh, one of the tips that I saw on, on YouTube from the judges was that uh, a lot of guys when they go to temper will fire up all three of those burners and those evidently are pretty hot forges that they have and they'll burn the tip of the knife before this part's even hot and, and ready to temper. So this is too soft, this is brittle and, and you've seen a couple of them where they break the end off. Um, so cut back to one burner in the center where you can control the heat better and then go in and out, roll it side to side, don't just put it all on one side, all on the other or straight like this. You want to eat, heat that thing evenly. You guys know all this again so a lot of this I'm just telling you to, to kind of put it back in your head and that way if my heat's coming down here I can keep this tip out of the out of there and that's probably the last thing that I want to really heat up and then make sure I got a nice even straw or whatever color you're going for and then do your your heat tree. Number two along with that while you're at home take one of these and if you temper by eye buy one of these if you don't have it and find out you know take some 01 and you say, okay, this is the right straw color that I always temper at. Bang, hit it with this. Find out what that temperature actually is. Because that way, if you can use these, you're way ahead of the game. Um, that, I, I don't know that they can, if, if they make a big deal out of tempering by eye or not, but 
That's a question you can ask, and you'd be way ahead of the game to find out. If not, then you might think, well, you know, once you physically check it, you may say, well, gee, that's a little bit too high. I better back that down, and I can get a better blade, or it's a little too low. And you can fix that color in your mind with what that, you know, the actual readout is. Uh, you may do that anyway, but, you know, do it. Um, you know, the other forging do's and don'ts, I'm, I'm just going to let you two work on that because you know it so much better than I do. Handles. I'm going to circle this one a bunch. That, that's one of the biggest downfalls and it just irritates me to no end to watch people put handles on on that show. Uh, guys that, make, that I know make incredible knives do the worst job of putting on a handle I've ever seen. Now here, I want to remind you of a saying that, that I heard once, and this was pertaining to shooting in combat. And that is, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So obviously, you're under a time frame. You've got so long to get this done. If you rush and you mess up the handles, you're behind the eight ball. If you go slowly, put yourself in your box, step by step, take your time with each step, overall, I bet you're going to put that handle on faster than anybody else in that room. So again, put yourself in the box, go smoothly, slowly, one step at a time. Okay, handle material is our first heading here. Uh, you know, a pretty burl wood, something like that. You know that Jay Nielsen or, or one of those guys is going to be wailing away on that knife. You don't want any kind of wood on there because it could be brittle. Uh, like burl, it could have little bits and pieces all through it that will easily crack. You want one thing and one thing only if you can get it, and that is my card. If you can't get my card, to get G10. Um, you know, you just want, the, 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 you know, here's a commercially designed, this was a competition chopper, they look much different now. This was an early one. My car to handles. See it, heat it, remember it. You don't want anything else, guys. If you have to, and all you can get is Kiranite, you know, that's, that's a good choice. But you want synthetic, you want that strength. Um, you know, beauty may impress the judges, but not when your knife falls apart. Uh, go with something that's going to get you into that final round. Pins. Uh, here's another downfall that I see. People using straight pins. Don't do that. Uh, I've seen on the show that they have, and here's a couple different kinds. Loveless bolts, you, you may have them in your shop, and you know what they are for sure. Use these, mechanical fasteners, not pins. Why, why do we want this? Well, because when you screw that down tight, at that point, you don't have to waste time doing a bunch of clamp up on the handle to get it to hold on there while the glue sets. Your mechanical fasteners are going to do that. B, you don't have to depend on your glue. If your glue fails, so what? You've got that thing locked in there with basically a, a bolt head on each side. It's not going anywhere. So I would highly recommend these. Um, a tip for these, when you put them in, I see people, they will take their drill press. They will drill their skinny hole, and then when they go to drill this hole, they'll switch the bit out and they will, um, you know, just try to do it by hand. Every time that twist drill will grab and pull by its very nature and go down too far. Remember, slow, smooth is fast. Take the time to set the stop on the drill so that it goes the depth that you want on that handle. It's going to be faster in the end, believe me. Um, So once you've got that, 
Uh, other people think differently, I don't, and in the last 50 years I can say this works. You can start working those handles almost immediately at that point, you can start grinding them. Do you want to get that handle material super hot? No, you will mess up your glue. But if you, you know, use a little bit of reason, it's not going to be bad at all. The other thing is, you got my car in steel, you can dunk that thing in the water and keep that handle cool. Uh, first off, you're not going to heat the steel up enough to do anything to it. Second off, the, you're sure not going to hurt the micarta or, or the, the pin, so that will, while other people are sitting there waiting for the glue to dry, you're finishing your handle. Um, okay, installation. We've covered a good bit of that just now. Um, use mechanical fasteners. Not, pins are not mechanical fasteners to me, they're just pins. They're there for decoration. Um, you know, if you peen them over, you can crack the handles. There's just, you know, they can be loose. There's a lot of things that can happen. Mechanical fastener, things bolted together, job done. Um, make sure you put a thin layer of glue on the handle. Make sure you put it on the, the material to be put on there. Uh, not just one or the other. And uh, I'd say you're, you're pretty well set at that point. Um, next, epoxy. This, this is just a quickie, but something that, that I want to bring up. On the show, I've seen that they have 5-minute epoxy, and they have 48-hour or 24-hour epoxy. Read, read the labels on the bottles. Make sure you grab the 5-minute epoxy, and that's what you're using. All right, we're down to E, shape, handle shape. Um, here we have a, a very nice little um, little Puko knife, and it has basically a round handle. Now, while it works great for small tasks, for heavy duty chopping, this is a poor design. Why? Because when you slam down into the wood, and we're imagining this is a big knife, if this edge hits off either way, it will just twist in your hand. Twist in your hand. So we don't want round. The best handle shape, and here's the best chopper I know of, the Forrester XXXL by Kyle Harris, CKC Nines. We have flat sides, but they are rounded, really nicely rounded on the edges. So that is extremely comfortable. It cannot twist in my hand. It cannot move. This knife, which was made as a competition chopper, these corners, I like this knife, and I'm going to fix this on here. These corners are too sharp. Now, they're, the, they're, the edges are broken, but not enough. And, and this thing will hurt you after a while. Don't overdo it. But you can, you can see that, I hope. I hope this will turn out. And um, you can see how round those are and how they just flow together. No ridges, no hot spots at all. Um, if you have a choil for whatever reason, make sure you break the edges of the choil so it's comfortable. But make sure you do enough rounding, but leave nice flat sides like this. So that when you lock it in, you know, your, your cross section is this way. Um, Guy and I were talking, Tim, about your knife. And this is, this is my favorite in his that you ever made. And the stag on this, the handle just feels great. Why does it feel great? Look what you got there. An oval. I got flat sides. I got rounded edges. It feels great. It's locked into my hand. It's not going to turn. Um, okay, finishing. And by here, I, I mean we're actually getting the knife ready to go. Um, blade shape. I see people fail on that when they should. They try to do some outlandish fancy shape. Do something easy to do, something that you know you can do, something you've done a bunch of times. 
Um, now, number one, an upswept Bowie. You do not want that. Why don't you want it? I don't know, you probably can't see it, but the tip was broke off of this one and they've done a, a, a file there. Why? Because that cut that takes away metal in here, right in that area, creates a weak point. If you want to make a bowie, fine, but make that flat, make it a, a straight back. Um, what I would really advise is a spear point. Your point's on center line. It's astoundingly strong. This is Jesse, one of your knives. And um, it's, it's very tough. If, if you want to, make a straight clip, a spear point, or you can do something along this line where you have a straight back and maybe even drop this a little bit. That's going to give you a very strong point. Grind. There's only one grind for a chopper and a slicer, and it's convex. And you want to bring it up. If you look at this knife, Kylie, again, best chopper I've ever used. This grind comes all the way up to here. Just, just barely that, well, the area of my finger covers is, is not ground. So you want a nice zero grind. Then you put another convex on the edge, not too steep, because if you do, even though you got this ground right, it's going to just wedge right there. So you want that edge blended. You want it to come back just like that edge does there. That should be one nice curve right there. That will determine how good that knife cuts. And when you sharpen it, get it, you know, as, as smooth as you can and all that. But then go back to something. I've seen they have 600 grit Norton stones there. Very lightly. Just raise it slightly. And just put a, a little bite into that thing so that it will grab. It will catch in the, the cloth when, um, uh, what's his name, does all his martial arts stuff and slices open bags. But the convex is also the strongest edge. So when they slam it into stuff, it's going to be far stronger, say, than this. I'm going to convex this edge. Um, you know, flat grind is, is pretty. Convex is where the strength is. Just don't make it too obtuse. You want a zero grind. You want it going all the way up the sides, coming down to your edge. That's huge, huge right there. Um, thickness goes hand in hand with that. Um, you want as much steel there to give you a sufficient amount of strength. I would say four mils, five mils, somewhere in there. Should be plenty if you do everything else right. Um, and, and again, look at the back of this knife, but of course that's a, that's a big knife. Um, let's just check this out at the back. Okay, that's eight mils. So uh, for for a, a, a chopper the size of this, At the back there, we've got about five mil, so somewhere around five mil is going to be pretty ideal. And um, five mil is about one thirty second. Eight mil is about twenty one sixty four. So somewhere in there. Um, okay, that's blade grind, tempering and drawing. Triple draw. Tim, you're the one that taught me this. Uh, they do obviously have to draw the knives down. I'm told they do it off camera because it's just one of those things that's not interesting. If they give you the time, triple draw it, double draw it, do as many as you can, up, you know, up to three. Because as you know, each time it refines that steel. Um, and on the tempering, 
go back up here where we were talking about checking with this earlier. Make sure you, you got that right. Sharpening. I just kind of covered that. Um, I would make it as smooth as I could and then just lightly, just with the weight of the blade, touch that thing. The other thing is when you're sharpening, I want you to sharpen the wire edge off. Don't try to you know, break it off in some wood by dragging it through it because that's what you do. You break it off, you either bend it over or you rip a chunk out. Either way, you're going to have a dull knife. Sharpen it off till it's gone. You keep going back and forth with the extra time that you gain by using the steps I showed you. Then when you sharpen it off, you've got a true convex sharp edge there and keep going with finer and finer grits. Use the finest one they got. And then once it's gone, then go back and touch it up. And you're going to be way ahead of the game there because they just some of the worst sharpening jobs I've ever seen. Finally, judges. Listen to the judges. People lose because they don't listen to the judges. They give you, tell you how long the hand's got to be, how long the blade's got to be. Take a piece of chalk, a magic marker, mark it on your anvil. Put the links on there. Mark it out. Forge to that length, check it before you turn it in, and then you know it's right. As long as you know, and measure twice when you measure it on your anvil. Make sure you got the right lengths on there and then forge to it. The other thing is, all of the judges at different times have said, you know, ah, people just don't listen to us. And they're absolutely right. People don't listen to them. They'll point out a flaw that is correctable. And the people go and do all the other stuff, but they, they don't correct that flaw. If you do correct that flaw, even if it doesn't pan out perfect, you put that judge in a spot, whether he realizes it or not. Uh, for instance, Doug Marcotta one time uh, told the guy that his ring for his caramba was too far back. And the guy listened to him. The guy cut out a section, welded the handle back together, and moved the ring up where it should be. Now, at that point, because he listened to Doug's advice, he's put Doug on the spot. Because Doug can't now go on television and say, well, yeah, he listened to me, but it's still not right. You know, and he may say, well, it's still not perfect out loud, but when it comes time to judge, he's put himself in a bind. He, he, he's not going to go against his own advice. So listen to what the judges are saying. Again, attitude, compartments, focus, the waterfall. When you walk in, everything else is forgotten. That's the best I can give you guys. I hope it'll help. And uh, Jesse, we are going to get you on that program. I ain't going to rest until I do. And uh, get me my damn knives down here so I can do a video. That's your job. Tim, steel charts. Check them. Do them. Check temperature ranges now while you got time. Use the right locking mechanical fasteners, not pins. Just pretend the glue's not going to work. All right, guys, that's it. And I will talk to you later.